there's a famous quote from St. Augustine goes like this, miracles do not happen in contradiction to nature, but only in contradiction to that which is known to us of nature. What we're going to talk about now sort of fits in that category, a phenomenon known as walk-ins, something, as I said at the top of tonight's program, that I'd never heard of before until I made a visit to Vail, Colorado a couple of months ago and got into a conversation with some really interesting people, including our next guest tonight. Uh, Basically, the phenomenon of walk-ins is a soul exchange. You know, one day you have this soul, the one you presumably were built, born with. The next day, you're someone else entirely. Uh, you're not home anymore. Is this real? And if so, why does it happen? Sheila Seppi became a soul exchange walk-in on September 23, 1999, at her home in Virginia. Immediately, her body was healed from documented illnesses, and she took on a new personality. Three months later, she left her husband, took the kids with her. Within six months, she accepted a new job, relocated to a different state, began her integration process as a, quote, walk-in with the guidance of her spiritual teacher. What's all that about? We're going to get right to it right after this on Coast to Coast AM. Welcome back. Walk-ins, the cosmology of the soul is the name of a book written by Sheila Seppi. Sheila, welcome to Coast to Coast. Hi, thanks so much for inviting me. As I I told our listeners, um, I had never heard of this before, and uh, it's hard to surprise me in these kinds of topics, but until (laughs) I got into a conversation with you there in Vail, uh, you and some of your friends and colleagues, Gary and others, uh, I never heard of it and uh, didn't know what to think of it. But uh, after about 10 minutes of hearing your story, I thought this is a natural for coast to coast, so I'm glad you come here to to share your tale with us. Uh, Had you ever heard of walk-ins before it happened to you? Oh, absolutely not. And George, I have to tell you the truth. If this had not happened to me, I'm not sure I would have ever believed it because I had never read a metaphysical book. I did not believe in past lives. I was not studying anything. Um, I was in a very religious mindset, not spiritual. And I honestly had never heard the term walk-ins before. Your life was kind of a mess. Can you set the stage for us here, set the table, so to speak, what was going on with you when it happened? Absolutely. So this event happened in October or September of 1999, and I was a very, very sick person. And over the course of 20 years, I had been diagnosed with brain tumors, Uh, bone cancer, fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue. Um, I walked with a cane. I had erythema nodosum, sarcoidosis, and they told me that I had the beginning stages of MS. I also had uh, rheumatoid arthritis, so it made it really difficult for me to open and close my hands and honestly celebrate was my best friend. And so needless to say, I was in a lot of pain mentally, physically, emotionally, spiritually. I went to bed that way, and what felt like about 7 o'clock in the morning, I was just in bed asleep. It felt as if someone reached down, grabbed me by the hair of my head, pulled me bolt right up in bed, and lightning ran through my body. Now, that's the only thing that I can compare this with was lightning, and then I was in white space, but When I was in that white space, I was out of pain. I didn't have any concerns. I felt this unconditional love. And if it had been up to me, I would have stayed there. But what happened was as I sat there, my peripheral vision started coming in and then my frontal vision. And as I started looking around the room, of course, everything looked the same, but everything felt different. So I could look at a photograph on the wall, and it was almost like one of those Harry Potter scenes where all the um, information about the photo just came flooding to me. Or I could look at a piece of clothing, and it wasn't like I would just remember it. It was like there was a story attached, and I was hearing it play over in my mind. And then I started... um, having all this past life information come to me, which, as I said earlier, I did not even believe in. So as I got up and began moving around the room and I caught my image in the mirror, I was dumbfounded. I just stood there and stared at myself. It was like 
honestly, it was like I'd just seen myself for the first time, and I was looking out of somebody else's eyes, so I was checking out my hair and my teeth and, you know, looking at my skin and obviously feeling very, very strange. Now, in this strangeness, I didn't realize it at the time, but every one of those health issues that I mentioned to you was completely gone. And when I went to my doctors, they had absolutely zero explanation. They couldn't even offer an explanation. They just said, well, we guess it's a miracle. I guess our medications work. Kind of patted me on the head and sent me on my way. But, you know, in those first moments, everything was so brand new and it was so visceral that I still can recall that sensation even today. And as I was sitting there, and these past life memories was coming back to me, there was also healing modalities coming to me, information that I had never studied. And quite frankly, I really, I couldn't even understand a lot of the information that was being shown. And then I had all this universal information and densities and dimensions and all kinds of information was just flooding my mind. And I had absolutely no explanation for it. But as I got up and I started walking around and feeling everything, it was like I had never felt carpet before. And when I opened up the refrigerator, all these aromas came wafting out. And when I felt the sun on my skin, it was like I had experienced it for the first time. Now, my background was psychology. So between the illnesses, the dysfunctional marriage, having a stressful job, having three young children. Honestly, I thought I was having a psychotic break, but fortunately I wasn't. And so as the weeks went on, the months went on, it became very clear to me that I was unable to stay in that marriage. So within the first three months, as you mentioned, I did leave the marriage. And within the next three months, I accepted a job in another uh, state, and as I was moving there, um, I had gone to visit and was flipping through the phone book. We didn't have Google at the time, so I'm flipping through this telephone directory trying to look for services for my children to find out where's the parks, what kind of activities are there, et cetera. And when I opened up that bag, it was, it was one of those things like uh, this business card just popped off the page and it was kind of like the ta-da, you know, with the light shining on it. And it was an ad for a spiritual counselor. Well, like I said, my background was in psychology. So I thought, man, do I need that? I immediately called her. Of course, it was after hours and I left the message um, letting her know that I thought I was having a psychotic break. And um, I had a meeting with her um, like within a week or two. Because she's she not only back. She's Pardon not only a spiritual counselor, but she has a degree in psychology or psychiatry too. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, she had her doctorate in psychology, and she actually was a Berkeley PhD. She had her own successful practice in California before she moved to Kentucky because I was at in Virginia at the time. And once I accepted this new job, it was in Kentucky, and that's the phone directory. Um, for, it was actually Somerset, Kentucky, and I found her ad in the back of the book. So as I was meeting with her, um, honestly, I expected to go in and get the little, you know, a little blue pill that I could take and all of this stuff would just go away. Because remember, I was very Western medicine oriented. And so at that time, I was still working through all the cellular memory and programming that I had. And so after I met with her um, a time or two, she is the one that said, you know, I really don't believe you're having a psychotic break. I can find no evidence of that. I'm like, what do you mean? What happened? And she goes, honestly, have you ever heard the term walk in? Well, I hear I'm thinking, oh, yeah, you walk in, you get a haircut, you walk in, you get whatever. And I'm like, you mean like you walk into a store? She goes, no, no. Have you ever heard of a soul exchange? Well, when she said that, honestly, the first few seconds, I just, it was like my brain went numb. Because I'm like, 
what is this woman talking about? You know, here I'm coming for counseling because I think I'm having a psychotic break, and she's talking to me about soul exchanges, which, of course, I wasn't open to at all. And so I left that office, and honestly, I was mad. I think I had my little high heels on. I was clicking going down the stairs, and I was just mad at getting my car. But by the time I started my engine, everything she said just kind of washed over me. I picked up the phone and said, okay, when can we schedule the next appointment? Mm -hmm. And working with her was the best thing that ever happened to me because she honestly helped me to anchor in this new soul energy. And I was able to understand in a very articulate way with someone that I trusted who had a PhD from Berkeley, what was happening to me now. Not only was she a psychologist, but she also was of Hopi lineage. And she began to share with me some of the teachings uh, that she had learned on the reservation when she was growing up. And I was invited to participate in some of the groups she had started, and she called these circles. And it was a variety of women, and it was there that I started learning the basics of shamanism. I started learning about how to connect with the energies of the tree, how to connect with the rocks, how to listen to the wind, how to stand outside and feel that oneness of being connected with source energy or God, however you, you know, want to call that. But I could feel all that energy running through me, but she taught me about spirit guides. So for the first time ever, instead of me thinking I was crazy because I was getting these messages that I could hear, just like we're talking, I could hear messages, I could see people walking around that wasn't there. For the first time ever, I started feeling my sanity return because it's like, oh, these are my guardian angels. These are my spirit guides. These are my teachers. And at least I had a framework that I could begin to start putting all of this madness into. And so the more that I learned, the more I was able to do what the Native people call shamanically traveling. I'll and we what, learned I'll, about I'll the different what. layers of reality. Sheila, before we jump into that, let's go back to the beginning. Day one. Sure. I, I want to get a sense of what's going on in your head, because day one, Suddenly, there's somebody else. Nobody's home, and there's somebody else in the attic. Uh, <laughs> what, exactly happened to, what happened to what happened to previous Sheila? Where did where did previous Sheila go? Okay. Well, I appreciate your asking that because for the longest time, I felt like I was a body snatcher. And after learning how to connect with my guides, I was able to ask them, "What did happen? I know the body was sick. Did I just kind of like kick that soul out?" Where in the world did she go? And that's when they began to explain to me about pre-birth plans. And they said that as a soul, each one of us determines when we're going to be born, the types of activities we're going to participate in, if you will, it's kind of like a business plan with our goals and our objectives. And um, But anyway, they were telling me that this soul had set up this scenario as the exit point for them and the entry point for me. And so I felt um, initially not only like that I was going crazy, but it was almost like every fiber of my being was so hyper aware that I really didn't know, you know, what to do. And in those first moments, just waking up the one of the things I do have to say that within a probably within a couple of days I started realizing that I did not have the same memories that I went to bed with Now I didn't remember what memories I had but I knew I didn't have memories I did come in with an immediate love from my children and my parents but I felt disconnected from everybody else. So needless to say, I lost every friend that I had, even family members I didn't feel a connection with. And that was huge because my mom came from a huge family with 
18 brothers and sisters. I had like 63 first cousins and uncles and aunts. And, you know, I, I just didn't have any history with those people anymore. And so over a period of time, my mom began to notice this. And within a couple of months, she sat me down because I had gone back to Virginia for a funeral. And she noticed that all the people coming up and talking to me, I had absolutely no clue who they were. Now, I could fake it pretty good. It's like, oh, yeah, how you been? How's the family? How's life? You know, all that kind of stuff. But the reality of it is I didn't have a clue who these people were. And so after the funeral, my mom sat me down on the couch, and she goes, okay, we need to have a talk. And I thought, "Uh uh-oh, here it comes. She must be sick. Something's going on. And she said, I need you to make an appointment to go back to the doctor. I'm like, well, what are you talking about? She goes, I think you have the beginning stages of Alzheimer's. And I'm like, what do you mean? She goes, you don't know anyone. You don't remember anyone. You will stop talking in the middle of a sentence like you're trying to to think and to pull information out. And she goes, I'm really, really concerned about you. And it was at that point that I sat down with my mom and told her that I was a walk-in. And um, at the oh time, <laughs> she was in her 60s, but she took it pretty well. Oh, <laughs> really? Mom, mom was okay with that? <laughs> well, you know, the way that I explained it was, I said, you remember when I was really sick? She goes, yes. And I said, and you remember how all of a sudden I became clairvoyant and I was getting messages and I got into mediumship and all this information was coming and I started studying all these new healing modalities? She goes, yeah. I said, well, that's when it happened. I actually was so sick that that old soul left and a brand new soul came in and Even though the color drained out of her face, she said, does that mean I'm not your mom? And I'm like, no, no, no. You're my mom just to a new, improved version. And she sat there for a minute and was like, oh, okay. (laughs) You know, it was like, you know, she was perfectly happy with that, uh, you know, information. It's like, oh, I've got a brand new daughter. Everything's fine. She's still my daughter. Life is good. So Yeah, she's my daughter and those are my grandkids and everything's fine. That's exactly right. Yeah, so that's right. She was happy with that. Well, that's that's great. I, I, I think we're going to take a break when we come back. I, I'm curious about, again, back to that day one, you had some memory loss. So I'm wondering how you navigate around, how you find work, how you're able to drive a car. I mean, it must have been a very confusing first couple of days there, right? You better believe it. <laughs> OK, we're, we're talking with Sheila Sep- Seppi about her book, Walk-Ins, The Cosmology, The Soul. Very entertaining uh, read, I'll tell you. And we're going to go to a break now. Sheila, you were telling us that uh, you believe that this arrangement, this new soul comes in, previous soul leaves, that this arrangement was agreed to before you were born, that there was an agreement that was reached and that was the plan. Uh, Those first few days after it happened, though, you had to be really confused. I mean, where was this current Sheila? Where was she before? And where did previous Sheila go? Are they floating out there somewhere? Uh, Well, I I wouldn't necessarily call it floating, but um, I'll I'll come back to where the souls reside here in just a moment. But George, you know, even though I didn't remember the people and the events from my previous life, I did retain like the basic life skills of driving and eating and dressing and taking care of the kids. I was kind of like on automatic pilot. And I think that what had occurred is as that soul left and the new soul came in, that's when I felt that lightning. And in working with my what I call my collective, which is my team, et cetera, but in working with my collective, they said that when the new soul came in, it came in with such a force that it helped to propel the old soul out, and that's when I sat bolt right up in bed. And like you, I was curious, where did the soul go? So one of the things that I have learned is, first off, we all have been around for millions and millions and sometimes billions of years. 
because when that source energy uh, desired to know itself and this individuation uh, began, there was what I call this big master oversoul where all of the souls have come from. And as we have continued on our journey, we take multiple forms lifetime after lifetime, whether it's on this planet, other planets, other dimensions, other densities, whether, you know, we're a multidimensional being having all these different life experiences all at one time. What had happened with me is I actually had had, um, all right, if you make a fist and you stick all your little fingers out straight in the air, this fist represents your primary oversoul. All these little fingers dangling represent multidimensional lifetimes. But above this fist, there's another fist which contains multiple oversouls. I was part of that multiple oversoul collective. So there was a resonance factor with the body, even though I was not a future aspect, I wasn't a past life aspect, I really had never lived or experienced the life that that soul had lived. But because of that resonance factor, I was able to enter into a sixth form without frying the biology, which was huge. There had been a framework that had been established within the spiritual bodies, which of course reside outside the physical body, that allowed me to drip by drip begin to enter into the body. And the more of these drips that began to solidify, the more I began to be the me that I am now. When my guides told me about a life plan and I started asking them, they said that a lot of times it's these plans are made thousands and thousands of years in advance, but sometimes they actually happen almost instantaneous. And for me, that was the case. Now, for many souls, it's a pre-birth plan, but in my case, um, this is where it, it as if this isn't strange enough, but this is where it gets even stranger. <laughs> I remember before incarnating being in a non-physical form. I was in what you would call the soul form, and I was there with all of my multidimensional aspects. So all those little fingers that I talked about had come back together and retracted back into the oversoul and back up into the larger oversoul. Now, these little aspects of me uh, throughout my various incarnations had been like angelic, Arcturian, Andromedan, Syrian, Lyran, Mantis, part of the Christ consciousness or the Christos energy, as all of us have. But I started remembering that. So that, that was a little bit different. But my collective literally basically took me by the hand in those first few days and even to this day, they still provide me information. So when I was in this collective form, I literally remember being in the Andromedan system when there was this cry or this um, tugging from Gaia, the Gaia consciousness. Now, let me explain about the Gaia consciousness because she is what would be termed a high seventh density being. She was purely non-physical, as was I, but within this state of being, the higher or um, I really should say the less form that you take, the lighter this energy becomes, but the stronger this energy becomes because you begin to gather other like souls with you in a joint purpose. And so beings in this density are purely non-physical or in the etheric nature, and they begin to connect with other souls, their soul families, soul group members, and they begin to experiment with merging their consciousness. Now, in this form, it's mainly a silica crystalline-based form, whereas what we are right now is primarily a carbon base. So we go from carbon to silica, 
to silica, to other forms, et cetera, et cetera, till we get to this silica carbon base. And by the end of this density cycle, this consciousness can be actually placed into planets or moons, um, and it just becomes a planetary consciousness. That's what had happened with Gaia. And we felt a call from her. Now, what I have come to remember in Earth time, this would have been somewhere around the 80s, and we received a call to come back to assist the planet with this awakening consciousness because the Earth itself in its original form would be what we call the organic Earth. Now, all the planets, as my collective has shared with me, all the planets in the solar system have been set up as 5D planets or fifth density planets. Now, this is something that was hijacked later on. And there was Earth, and then there was a crystalline structure that is an etheric nature above the Earth and outside the ionosphere, but it holds that 5D consciousness energy. It beams the 5D consciousness energy into the planet where it then connects with the crystalline structures of the Earth, mainly the ley lines, which are of crystalline nature. So between the crystalline um, grid and those ley lines, there's this beautiful surge of energy that comes that basically feeds the beings, the life forms, all the sentience, all the grasses, everything on this planet with that 5D energy. But what had happened is, according to the Hopi, we are in the fourth world. People can, you know, go back and study the Hopi teachings, and they have various explanations for how each of these worlds ended. But according to the Hopi, we now are in the fourth world. This fourth world has been here for at least 12,000 years. And during that 12,000 years, what was set up was called the false matrix. The false matrix was basically the cesioelectric field that was above the crystalline grid that was being beamed in that was sending information in to the species on the planet that basically let them think that they were separate from source let them believe in things like fear, sickness, illnesses, anger, you know, all of these what we would term negative emotions and energies were being fed in to the planet. And there was a disruption in the original intention of the crystalline grid. So we were being called from Gaia along with hundreds of thousands of other collectives to come and to help in this restoration process. So we were trying to restore that original earth grid with the um, crystalline grid. And we were beaming in, for a lack of better term, um, we were beaming in frequencies and light codes to help people to wake up and to remember who they truly are at a soul level. And so being here already when this soul cried out to be released and there was a resonance factor, it was decided by the collective that I would be the aspect to come in. And as I came in, I did retain all of that basic um, life skill information of driving and eating and dressing, etc. So I was, I was basically on an automatic pilot for an extended period of time, still receiving direct communication from my collective to help me be able to operate in this 3D reality. So those first few days, needless to say, <laughs> I was nothing but dazed and confused yeah. and nothing, absolutely <laughs> nothing seemed to fit me anymore. My personality changed. My taste in foods changed, the way I dressed the way I articulated my thoughts. I did an absolute 180 on everything in my life. But one of the biggest changes, and that was noticed by everybody, especially by my children, 
who just accepted this new person as their mom because all of a sudden I was fun and I had this energy and I could play with them. And everybody noticed that there was something different about me. And the more I tried to articulate what was happening to me or what I remembered happening, the more they told me that I needed to be quiet because I sounded (laughs) crazy, which, of course, then just reinforced my own thoughts that I was having a psychotic break. But honestly, within those first few days, even though everything was like heightened and strange to me, my thoughts began to clear. And drip by drip, more and more of my soul energy entered into the body because this framework had already been laid within the spiritual system so that I didn't fry that sick biology. Well, I wasn't being flippant when I asked that question. I was really curious how it works, because as you mm-hmm. write in your book and as I read online in preparation for this interview, um, there are various kinds of walk-ins. There are different kinds mm-hmm. of setups that you describe. And I just I was curious, whether is there ever a hostile takeover where a soul is coming in? That's the plan. But they the one that's there doesn't want to leave. Exactly. You know, I asked the exact same thing because I, have, I said, am I a body snatcher? What the heck is going on? And you hear of people all the time of like possessions and all of a sudden their personality has changed, but it's to a negative state. And when I worked with my collective, they told me that when a walk-in comes in from wherever it is, whether it's a star seed, which means they're directly from a planet on into a body or whether they're part of a collective or whatever, that there is a resonance factor that causes them to come in. And we basically are here to do good. So if someone is saying, oh, this person's a walk-in, but now they're evil, that's something totally different. And I would be saying that's more of a... um, Mm, I guess for lack of better terms, we call it a possession, something like that. But what I've also learned is depending on your vibrational frequency, there is absolutely nothing out there that can harm you unless you have an agreement for it to happen. And people would say, you're crazy. There is no way that I would have asked for this accident or to become mangled or to have this horrific event happen to me. But I beg to differ because on the soul level, when you rise above all of this minutia of this planet and you're looking down, it's very, very different. So what you think might be people in your life that's causing you problems on the upper soul level, they may be one of your buddies saying, okay, now you've got this soul wound. That needs to be healed. It could be from another past life or you're going to experience this, but I'm going to serve as your trigger. And when this event happens, now you have the opportunity to heal this physically, mentally. Well, for the body, it'd be physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually. For the soul, it's a soul growth, learning how to release, how to let go, to incorporate more of those higher spiritual natures, which would be like the unconditional love and forgiveness. And so when people tell me that they know of a walk-in, but that they are um, not very positive, then I, I really say, well, I have to beg to differ because in my understanding, from my collective, that's not what happens. But there are, as you mentioned, several different types of soul experience. And I I've started calling walk-ins a soul experience because, like, for me, it was literally the old soul out, a new soul in. But for other people, there can be, like I was talking about earlier, drip by drip by drip, more soul energy coming in from a much, much higher level that takes place over a much longer period of time and that's okay. called soul infusion. Okay, we're we'll t- we're going to come back and take a break and get into a little bit more about that and then just the the general idea about I guess you're saying we are spirits, we are souls who happen to be in human form at the time, which is sort of goes back to the quote I had about you're a ghost driving a meat-coated skeleton made from stardust, which is a pretty cool way to look at it. We're talking with Sheila Seppi about walk-ins, the cosmology of the soul. 